We are off to the races, ladies and gentlemen. Another episode, another installment of The Conspiracy Farm. I want to say thank you to everyone who's been very patient. I know it's been a minute since we've done an episode. A couple weeks, two, three weeks maybe. I moved back down to St. Louis, and that transition lasted a little bit longer to get everything set up than I had anticipated. So obviously that put the show shows uh, on a little bit of a back burner. Uh, Patrick J. is not here this week. The guy's got a lot on his plate. Three daughters. You know, more business ventures on his plate. We have the new show, Everything Combat, as well as him being on a plane every single week announcing for Mark Cuban's Access TV. So you're going to have to just deal with me today. So you'll be fine. I'll be very, very gentle. And today, man, I apologize for being so late on the ball here, sir. But uh, as we talked a little bit off there, off air, this is one of those subjects that I could talk for hours and hours and days and days. It runs a very close second to uh, the JFK assassination, which I can, which I can go on forever about. Um, I really wanted to take a break from the geopolitical madness as we've seen in the last week and how it's manifesting. It's so absolutely sad. Um, the, the right versus left, it's it's really crazy. But we're going to kind of get somewhat indirectly into why these divisions take place and how effective these divisions are in this conversation with our with my guest today. He is an author. He is a researcher. He is a scholar. Most recent book is the state stage of time. Correct me if I'm wrong on that stage of time. And then the most recent, uh, the one previous to that was the illusion of us, which is very, very fascinating. And um, it, it kind of echoes the work of individuals like Randall Carlson, who we've had on the show, Graham Hancock and his book, Finger, fingerprints of the God civilization with amnesia. We're going to get to the root of a lot of that and why this has happened, how it's happened. Matt LaCroix. Thank you so much. And apologies for the delay, sir. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I'm I'm really enjoying um, our transition through fall here up, up in up in Maine where I live. It's getting quite a bit colder, but you know I I really enjoy the seasonal changes. So I'm I'm embracing it. Finishing the, the you mentioned the stage of time. It's it's almost done. So I'm. My engines have been focused on that, but I want to take a break and do a nice a show here or there. Perfect, perfect. And you know this is a perfect show for it. The Conspiracy Farm. Man, again, there's so many layers to this conversation. Like I said to you off air, I really enjoy your videos because you really make the information very comprehensive for such a for such a huge, vast subject. You do a great job of that. So like I said, I'm going to try to give you a few slow pitch softballs straight down the middle and you can just knock it out of the park. And I will jump in with questions and names and because I, I <laughs> over the last several days of of research and copious note taking. Um, my notes are a little bit of everywhere, but we're going to definitely delve into it. So I want to start out. I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. Joseph P. Farrell, Oxford PhD, um, has, has work definitely kind of coincides with yours on, on, on a cosmic war starting things out. So that's kind of where I want this conversation to begin because it seems like that's where it all kind of begins. As we talk about, as we've known in history about these these gods, if you will, um, that have been quote unquote mythologized, it is your your of the mind that these gods were actual physical human beings, and not physical human beings. They were physical, in fact, actually physical beings, and that begins kind of all of this. How we've been divided through these two. A lot of people have heard of the Anunnaki, and a lot of people are familiar with the work of Zachariah Sitchin in the ancient cuneiforms of Sumeria. But as you even said, Zachariah wasn't the first one. George Smith was a little bit before him as far as the translations. And it, it, they do begin with this kind of cosmic war between a, within a family, Enlil and Enki. And what that the significance of those two human beings and the eagle versus the serpent, because that seems to draw out, you know, centuries and centuries and thousands of years, this this kind of internal war in this family of Enlil and Inky. Drop it like it's hot, sir. Tell me about these two individuals and the significance of the eagle versus the serpent serpent, and this kind of internal family war between um, Enlil and Inky and who these per people are. And, okay, well, and their, and their um, kind of two sides on how they want to see human beings progress or not progress. First, I want to clear a couple things up. Sure. Um, and the first thing is these... Anunnaki beings, a lot of these beings that have been part of our history that have been called gods, in most cases, they become what's called non-corporeal, which means they do not need to take on a physical body. That's a very important point I want to make, because a lot of people 
get really um, sidetracked by the notion that there just are beings flying around in spaceships everywhere. And that's the stage they get to. And then all it is is just advanced technology and they come in and they multi-manage different, different places. But that's not really how it works, especially if you start to read things things like the Adrahasis and the Emerald Tablets, and you start to look into energy and light and what occurs on a fundamental level as beings start to um, mature on, a, on, a, on an energetic level. And what typically tends to happen that we've seen, or it really has to happen if you think about it, is where what happens with so, a powerful biological being like we are that has you know, chakra centers that are tuned to the visible light spectrum of all these incredible aspects of what makes us who we are. When you look at an ancient civilization, and I want to mention um, a couple in, in specifically that are m more or less tied together. And that would be something like you mentioned the Anunnaki, which are, which are in many cases just a collection of different different races and some beings. I think it's there's a lot of strong evidence, especially if you look at the Dogen out of um, Mali, Africa, that when, their strong connections talking about Sirius, the star constellation, and the Nomo, and how you can relate that back to the mitre hat and showing Enki and his the famous fish shoot, suit that he wore in Mesopotamia. To me, that correlates and connects back because they talk about strongly talk about Sirius, and then you have places like Orion with the the Great Pyramid of Giza and the King's Chamber that you know lines up perfectly to Orion, the masculine side. So here you have these two locations that automatically pop up. And furthermore, you, you, you look into the ancient Hopi and how in and, and the Mayans, they talk all about the, the Pleiadians. And so here we have these three locations that are brought up over and over again in ancient cultures all, all around the world. And to me, what it what it really tells is the fact that this term we have, Anunnaki, is really just a term that the Sumerians called them, which was referencing those who from heaven to earth came or those who from Anu sent to earth. Now, when you have advanced beings that are more than a million years old, potentially, and I know that's hard for a lot of people to wrap their head around, but when you, when you have that happen, if, you want, if, if a species is not going to annihilate and destroy itself, they have to transform into some kind of the next stage of their evolution. And that is the physical body in the third, third dimension that we see, everything around us in the third dimension, is just a stage, a stepping stone towards a much higher place. It's a stepping stone towards another state of energy. Okay, And so when we think about you know, the Anunnaki, which they actually call themselves the Anuna. And I want to strongly, strongly point out the fact that Zechariah Sitchin has some great work. But if you want to go to the source where you can't have, you can have nobody argue about how, that he might have made it up or that it's not real based on his work, please look into George Smith, who translated the Atrahasis and Epic of Gil Gilgamesh and several others almost a hundred years before Zechariah Sitchin, okay? And then you have Stephanie Daly that came along after then and took George Smith's work and basically verified and slightly updated it. And they're, we're talking about two of the most um, important Assyri Assyriologists in, in history. Some of these experts of the Mesopotamian civilizations and cuneiform writing and how to, how to correctly translate it. So when you read Stephanie Daly and George Smith and you correlate a lot of this work, it blows your mind because all of a sudden you, you you don't think to yourself, wait a minute, is this one person's mistranslation? But here's all these other experts that, that translated the same way or, or in many ways the same way. And to me, we, we need to really strongly look at that. And most people have never even heard of those two names, right? They've never even heard of George Smith and Stephanie Daly. I hadn't. I hadn't before. You know, um, I was very familiar with Zachary Sitchin, but I'd never heard of George Smith. And the question you should be asking is why? Yeah. Why do we have so the most important translators in history, in my opinion, um, that no one's ever heard of? And I think there's a very good reason for that, and that is what we're going to get into, is, is that this information, once you actually go in and you study it and you compare it to historical um, facts, it starts to really make sense for why certain things have happened. So getting back to what I was saying, beings throughout 
at least the galaxy and what we know of from the information we, we can gather and, and what we understand about physics and, you know, super string, string theory and everything that we can incorporate into our, our knowledge and understanding of how reality works shows us, and especially if you read the Adrahasis, it tells us essentially that powerful beings, meaning they had the ability to actually um, to affect the third dimension. Some call them, some have called them magicians in the past, and there's been a lot of different names because some beings become powerful enough that they can actually manipulate the events of reality. Okay, they have the ability to to alter both where their um, energy resides, meaning if they had a biological being in the third dimension like human beings that was designed to match their DNA, then they could incarnate and use or influence us at any point that they wanted. And that's how this game works, mm -hmm. okay? So when you, when you mention a lot of these names, when you mention names like Enki and Enlil, and then you mention some of the other names later on, like Zeus and Poseidon, and you bring up, you, you, you essentially go down the list of a lot of these ancient gods throughout history, you start to see some very strong correlations. Mm -hmm. And the way that I see those correlations is the fact that these incarnations, um, like for instance, Thoth, one of the most famous of all of these of these beings, right? He's one of these one of these these gods of of ancient Egypt when it was when back when it was known as um, the land of Chem or Kemet. He he his if you read the Emerald Tablets, it specifically mentions that he's he's an incarnation from the time of Atlantis. Okay, that's it's an incarnation of his of his previous being, which we we can connect to something like Ningshida. Okay, back in if you go back all the way back into Mesopotamia in these times. So what I'm trying to say is. When we come up across a lot of these names and a lot of these these different powerful figures throughout history, some of them were human and some of them were not, mm -hmm. meaning that some of them were the direct um, reflection of, of talking about these beings in maybe a non-physical form. And then some of them were actual people that they had incarnated into for various reasons, like if they needed to take be, be in charge of a, a powerful civilization um they could incarnate into a bloodline king and then they could rule through that so that's how we should really look at this is this cosmic battle essentially you bring up is the idea of here you have a bio an incredibly important biological being homo sapiens we are one of the reasons why all this is kept secret is that our importance, if it got out, it would fundam fundamentally change how people view and act in reality. Okay, as well as the architects of society's ability to hold on to to you know people. If you know if we were started to begin to receive the truth about you know really who we are, the origin of civilization, and human beings, that could obviously. I mean, I think that's part of the psychology as you'll get into of why they had to create this false reality for us so we don't get who we really are. Exactly. That's very well said. So back in the day, when, you know, thousands of years ago, you had this, these beings that came here, okay, and they refer to themselves, go read, go, um, and I'm going to have some direct translations from Stephanie Daly and George Smith in my, the new book, The Stage of Time, actually, I have a, quite a few, I think people are really going to enjoy a place where they can read the Atrahasis, the Enuma Elish, the Emerald Tablets, um, all and many, many, many more, all in the same place. Okay, and what they essentially say, if you go into a place like the Adrahasis, is that is that these these beings back in the day, long ago, they were competing for how the, the human humanity, essentially this the human race would would go. What would its future be? And that's what this big struggle has been, because. If you there are there are other beings that are very benevolent and some of them look at what's going on here and it's if you look at it from the outside if you just if you just take yourself and say to yourself okay I'm no longer a human being I'm just I'm just something like a spiritual essence of energy that's observing objectively observing Earth in our history and what we what we do here how we spend our time if you look at it. It, it's it's it really is an energetic slavery of what's occurring here because oh wow it, I like that term people, energetic slavery people are being forced and kept 
in their lowest form of energy possible so that what like what you said they they'll never be able to ascend their energy at all and they'll never change and well what happens when you do that that maybe maybe people don't understand or have incorporated it when you give your life to just working and watching tv and not seeking any higher knowledge and not seeking health and then you just die and then of course the last few minutes before you die you're wondering what you spent your life on when that happens you die and then you have to you have to be reincarnated you have to be recycled okay that's what that means now this is where it gets a little bit comp complex some of these beings were so sophisticated and so powerful in their understanding of, of how to manipulate energy and matter that they actually took over control of the incarnation cycle on earth and became the gatekeepers of it if you control a reality so that people are forced unknowingly forced to, to be kept in their lowest state of energy through fear and war and all this chaos that occurs on the planet okay then how are you ever going to be able to send to get out of that trap to to have your state of energy change you won't over and over we don't even know the people that are listening right now we don't even know how many lifetimes we've had to do this over and over and over again over and over because we keep have we we don't reach any kind of a higher state of energy and then we just die we see that playing out every single day and i know you're going to get more into this but the the, the notion of of your enlils and your eagles your your kind of eagle however you describe that that's been going on for so long so you're right i mean not only are we just busy and don't have time to look into this stuff the whole framework of society is geared to keep us, like you said, in that exactly. lower energy realm. And and people now, like you and I who have these conversations like, no, there's something else going on. We're crazy. You know what I mean? No, go back to sleep. Yeah. Go keep up with the Kardashians. Go stomp people on Black Friday for sales and get your new iPhone. It's it's all kind of geared in, you know, interwoven in our society to remain lower energy, as you say. Exactly. It's it's a perfectly and that's where you you know. I, I often people say, Well, how do you how do you know it's not just a bunch of really smart people that did this? Because it's way too perfect. If you actually look at the mechanics behind our reality, how food has been pushed to be incredibly unhealthy, how water ha you know, is, is, is not pure and it causes us to have a fluoride ingestion and then causes our pineal gland to be calcified. And then if you look at information all across how media is all controlled and showing us, like, like you said, all these reality shows and all this stuff that dumbs us down. And then our schooling system teaches us a certain version of reality where we believe that we should just be living this Darwinian survival of the fittest where we we just try to accumulate some wealth and some material goods and then we just pass it on and we die. Well, and even even I'm not to interrupt, but the, even the, even I don't mean to offend, ladies and gentlemen, I just have, you know, think about things a little bit differently. But even our religions, particularly kind of Christianity, like you're going to get to and talk about, we're amazing beings of light. But in some of these religions, nope, you are just condemned by sin out of the box. And they had to send this begotten son to absolve of, of these sins as opposed to like we were talking about. No, 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 no. We've been we've been kind of bamboozled in that regard and we're not you know we're not flawed we are magnificent human beings that like you said we're it, it it eludes us because of the way society is structured when i realized that for the first time i think i had to sit down on the ground for like four hours just <laughs> sit there and realize that shocking realization that first of all what you realize about yourself and, and as opposed to what you've been told which is an incredible moment when you realize that about you know what we really are on a infinite energetic conscious level rather than just being this physical body that just dies and then worms eat it and that's it yeah right and then on, on, the, on the other side it, it's amazing right you realize that you're this incredible being of light that's that that has the potential to reach anything and yet then you look at our reality you see that every single construct behind it is trying to prevent us from reaching that point yeah and to me that's a mind-blowing thing to wrap your head around it really it's, is it's it's almost like being in some kind of a, a science fiction movie. It really is. Our, our reality can often be stranger than fiction. You sounded like oftentimes that you're like in my head. And a great metaphor for this is the movie The Matrix. Not only have they created a false reality that we think is real, we're, we're, we're just like when Morpheus holds up the battery, we're just energy sources for the machine. Yes, and so we're just these energetic sources, and what happens to our energy? Well, you only have a certain amount of energy that you can use in your day before you have to then charge your battery sleeping, right? 
And that means that if you did want to try to discover all of these truths and spend a lot of time researching and studying and pondering and walking around outside and, you know, considering all of these things and trying to figure them out, where are you supposed to get the time to do that? Right. All, every, most people are, they work 40, 60 hours a week and then they drive home from being stuck in traffic and they're like exhausted. Yeah. And so what are they going to do? Well, nine times out of 10, they're going to sit in front of the TV and they're going to relax and they're going to do nothing. That's how the system is so perfect because it's been engineered so that, hey, oh, that's great. You want to go try to figure all those things? How are you going to make a living and how are you not yeah. going to die out in the woods somewhere? Yeah. That's And that's how it's a perfect system where we have to follow the rules and play the game or we're not going to make it. And, and, and am, I, am I correct in my assessment that this does go back to – to 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 your enlils who just didn't want to see human beings manifest into their true higher selves, whereas enlil he yes. he tried to do that. Okay, so let's go backwards. Um, we we got a little head there, but let's go back. So these beings that came here, look at our world today. Most of the powerful leaders and in, in organizations throughout history have been part of these kingship model structures, these royal bloodline families, and we still see it today. Which is bizarre if you think about it, how why we still have that, but yet it's it's reflection back on what really hasn't changed at all. And that is that if you read all of these tablets and you look at what they say and you try to understand it, you find out that these beings have a royal royal hierarchy structure. Okay? And that's where ours came from. Everything hence the, earth, hence the kingship was lowered from heaven. Exactly. The Sumerian king list, that is the very first thing that it says on the Sumerian king list, is that kingship was lowered from heaven. And then it tells you where it went in the Fertile Crescent, and then after the flood, it says that it was lowered again. Basically just telling us and in, in informing us that everything we see around us, laws, everything, is simply a reflection of what they developed and created here on Earth. Okay? So these beings come here. Why did they come here? Well, they wanted to, they came here for several reasons. They came here to harness the energy of the earth because earth, which they called ki, K-I, was very, very important. Every Everything is not the same. You, know, you can't just take earth and then just pick another planet and be like, okay, they're all planets, so they're all the same. Every planet, every star has a unique signature of energy, okay? And the re one of the reasons why earth has so much life is that it has an incredibly high energy. Um, amount of energy that it, the potential it has here and that's why you have you have so much life here it's in so much potential that could happen well so these beings came here and they found this what i like to call the living library of life here you know species everywhere and we had these early pre-hominids the neanderthal and the denisovian here and you had all these you had all these things coexisting in peace and, and perfection on this planet and they came here and they brought what the Gnostics call duality, meaning that before they came, there was no evil. There was no um, there was no war and chaos. None of that existed. And, and they brought it here and they turned our this reality here into this dualistic reality. And essentially we came here because of the energy of the earth and because the earth has incredibly rare resources. OK. Now, what do non-physical – remember, they can become physical whenever they want to, but they, but they remain, for the most part, like I said, non-corporeal. They remain as – they can remain as non-physical beings, and they reside in higher dimensions. Remember, the third dimension is the only, is the only dimension where, fit, where matter is physical. Okay, So if you, if you ascend and you, and, and you start meditating and you're in an incredibly deep state, you, you'll, you'll realize that you no longer feel being in your body. That's because you've essentially reached a higher state. Now, most of the time that's temporary because you have to open your eyes at some point sure. and you have to come back and you have to live in a third dimensional body. But as you follow this path and you study all these ancient writings and these secret societies and what they said, you can follow and you can basically change your state so that you can – you can coexist in both the third dimension as well as the fourth and fifth dimension essentially at the same time. And that is part of this whole path that they don't want people to reach. OK, now these these beings, they knew that the the Neanderthal and the Denisovian was had a similar um, had a similar makeup genetically to them. OK, and there was no other being on the planet 
that they would have the ability to, to, to incarnate into and use with, with a large brain because it just didn't exist. And so, but, but I want to also mention that this vision of humanity is, is so much farther beyond Darwinian evolution that I want to bring up the fact that I believe all the life here and, um, Denisovians and um, Neanderthals, they're part of outside influences from other, from, from other ancient civilizations that came here long before, okay? So this isn't just a situation where the Anunnaki arrived here and all this stuff was here randomly by accident and then they took it over. No, there was actually this cosmic war you mentioned. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is part of this idea of how this place is a free will zone. That's how it was set up and established, which means they had the ability to do whatever they wanted. And that's why this occurred, okay? And so these beings came here and they decided that they wanted to, you know, control the energy of the earth and the incarnation cycles here too, because they, they essentially feed off, they can, they can feed off of our energy, like in the matrix. If you, and if you look and watch that movie and you, and you see how the energy, the energy is being consumed like a battery, that's essentially what it's like for us being here. Okay. So we're, we're like these batteries, these super batteries that are running around on the planet and they essentially jumpstarted our DNA. That's, that's the missing link that happened somewhere around 200,000 years ago, according to all the ancient Mesopotamian records. And the Atrahasis is, is, in my opinion, the best example, along with the Enuma Elish um, Tablet 6, that really talks about how human beings were, um, were jumpstarted using their DNA. And, that, and that's the explanation for why we have no physical traits that belong in the animal kingdom. We don't really have very much hair. We can't survive out in the wild. We're, we're not like anything else on this planet. And our, our non-coding DNA that we, that we have inside proves, which represents the fact that our, we have DNA that doesn't match any other species on the planet. Okay. But something, something, that... you, something you've mentioned a couple times, and I don't, I, I don't want to assume that people kind of know exactly what this is. You haven't mentioned it yet, but I, I'm assuming it's kind of in tandem. The Nag Hammadi scriptures as well as the Enuma Elish, what is that exactly? Okay, well, the Enuma Elish is, um, is one of these Mesopotamian cuneiform writings. It's right up there with the Atrahasis as part of these, these ancient cuneiform writings that talk about ancient humanity and the events that occurred in the past. Whereas the Nag Hammadi um, library scriptures and... Things like the Book of Enoch, they're part of what's, what's called Gnostic wisdom. And now Gnostic wisdom emerged out of Egypt. Okay, so it's basically ancient Egyptian knowledge. And the Gnostics were part of these, this secret group, um, ancient group that came together. And they tried to reestablish what, what had been stolen on Earth. They were trying to reestablish the ancient knowledge and wisdom that was being lost on the planet. And, and this, the book of Enoch, that was written by, by Thoth or Thoth correctly? Or? Well, en and that's where you get into it, like, who was Enoch? You know, you, you start looking into the, the similarities between Hermes and Enoch and a lot of these figures, and you start to see correlations between right. them. And so that's where this battle of the eagle and the serpent comes in, where as after human beings were jump-started, okay, and we had this whole reign of kingships on Earth. Remember, these these beings are became greatly divided. Okay, if if people don't know, they became greatly divided over the future of humanity. And so there was factions that broke out between this royal family. And so one of these factions had beings like Enki and Thoth and and Ninma, Isis, and 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 then the other side, in in others, and then the other side, this more benevolent side, they had. Of course, Enlil and his son Inerta, and a lot of these figures like Marduk, in my opinion. So you have these two divided sides who are competing with how the human race is gonna is gonna end up. Now, the reason why things have gone the way they have is that for two two reasons. One, if remember I, I said there's a royal hierarchy structure that's present within these beings, and one of the problems with that is that Enlil is essentially one of the highest um, rating in terms of his decision making and his class. Okay, and so his this one of these beings who became greatly jealous and angered by humanity, and you can see that in the ancient Garden of Eden story. Okay, in that story, the god figure is Enlil. Okay, meanwhile, the serpent figure is Enki. Okay, so go back and read that. 
but but understand that it's been an inverted story and try to make us think that eating from the tree of good and knowledge would somehow be a bad thing well and, that, and that's what that's what started the original sin which necessitated yes. the begotten son to come which is just again so so fascinating that we were just condemned by this weird original this original sin and original story that just locked us into being just horrible sinners yeah and so exactly and so after this god figure being played by enlil who took on the role of yahweh jehovah this is the great Abrahamic religion, essential, essentially the ruler of all of those. He is the God figure in all of those. And then, and then of course, you have some, um, what I believe is this, this Christ figure, this sacrificial Christ figure, which I believe is Marduk. Okay, So we have these, which was actually a firstborn son of Enki. That's what gets so confusing. So many people say to, your, say to me, wait a minute, why are there symbols of the dragon and, 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 um, and, and symbols of serpents being affiliated with the Vatican? Because Marduk is part of Enki's family. Now, I didn't get into these symbols, and I want to explain it. These, these beings, they're, they go far beyond just the linear understanding of how they portray information. So they gave themselves symbols to portray everything that, that they represented. So instead of being the seasons or the different archetypes of, human, uh, of the human mind, look at it in this way. If you have a divide that occurs between one side who wants seeking higher knowledge and seeking uh, balance and higher energy, and then you have another side that is is jealous about the fact that this animal, this Neanderthal Denisovian ape animal, which we are, we do have uh, connections back to that, they became very jealous over the fact that we – were given such gifts by Enki, this master geneticist, who that tricked them into creating this worker here that could be an incarnation worker that ended up having the potential to be even greater than them. Wow. That's what this all gets down to. In a nutshell, these beings are, some of them, are incredibly angry at the fact about how our story turned out. We were never supposed to be as as incredible as we are the potential of what we are is is nowhere near what some of them were hoping we would right so essentially our design became so sophisticated and advanced with their dna that like i said we had the potential someday in our future to become even greater than them and that really scared them okay and so and in enlil used to call us beasts and that just got right down to how he felt about us and so what essentially happened is because the last two zodiacal time periods, you know, where we look back at Pisces, the one we the one we're still in right now, this time period was was allowed to be ruled by a certain side of this of this of these groups. Yes. And that's why it ended up being such a negative duality. So his time's going to come up soon as soon as the procession of exactly. Aquarius comes in. Before yeah. before we d talk about original sin and you know um Enlil being the or the Enki being the master geneticist and you know how we are a product of his his toolings, talk to me about Adam. Adam's role, you know, the biblical role, we know what that was, but who was Adam in the context of of your research? Adam had a couple a couple different names. His real name if you want to get past the biblical name was actually Adamu. And th and there's been a couple other names that have been given, but essentially the first human being that was ever on the ever designed on the earth and he was considered a perfect being designed so perfectly that actually um that is where the fear came from was here you have this perfect being and it has it has the potential to become so consciously aware that it will end up taking over its own reality and it'll break this this spell here of them controlling our reality and controlling incarnation. That's what it's all about. It's yeah. all about controlling energy and resources. Yeah. After successional lines of Adam and the different family, the members that came from that, and if you go look at genealogy table of Adam in the early times, you'll see Enoch right below, a couple a couple people right below that. That's because back in the day, that's these these human beings were so smart and so sophisticated that they were essentially almost gods themselves. OK, and then we had something happen. Enlil and others decided that the only means to stifle this growth was from a two a two pronged um, situation. The first thing they tried to do was wipe off all of these 
um, civilizations and advanced people in a great disaster. And I, and I want to talk a lot about that if we can get into that when yeah. we're talking about theological wars with what, what are what's called the antediluvian civilizations, which represent all of these ancient civilizations that came before the flood. And I, and I want to talk about that um, quite a bit if we can after this, this point. But so basically it means that after, you know, a lot of these civilizations were destroyed, there was um, a, G, a DNA tampering that occurred within the human genome. And they, they wanted to essentially dumb us down so that we could not re and unplug our DNA so that we could not reach these higher stages of consciousness and energy so that we could be controlled. So essentially when you when is this you is this following that, the initial engineering of making us who we in Lil's initial or Inky's initial engineering of you know creating us is this another genetic uh, genetic manipulation this, that happened Yeah and this had nothing to do with anything with Enki or anything with them wanting to do this this was purely based on Enlil and the and that side of okay of the hierarchy that was number 1 in charge and number two, they realized that if they lost control of conscious energy on the earth, that the whole game would be up. The whole game would be up. And they also could see the future of the potential of what the human race could become. And so they dumbed down the human genome. And, and I like to talk a lot about this when I refer to the fact that if you take a, D, a, a more advanced DNA test, a blood test, okay, and I highly recommend people do this. Get past the antigens known as A, you know, A, B, O, all of those. That's a, what's called a primary antigen in blood. Okay. There's what's called a secondary antigen, which represents this RH factor. Now, it's interesting that most people have no idea that this even exists. If you if you were to work, look at the most common people that are tested, um, is is mothers, if what their Rh factor is, and of course, no people are like just don't even know what that means. What it means is this: when they genetically downgraded us, they downgraded us by incorporating certain primate DNA back into us to essentially bring us back to an early earlier state. And now, what that what that um, primate was 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 closely related to what's called the rhesus monkey. Okay, people can find those if they look in places like Madagascar. Now, that's why it's called the rhesus factor. So it comes down to just basically, if you get tested, you're either tested positive for the rhesus factor or you're tested negative for the rhesus factor. And what that means is if you test positive for the rhesus factor, it means that you are one of those bloodlines that was part of that genetic downgrade. And now, I want to point out is, is, is that related to the Atlanteans at all or descendants it of Atlantis? Is. Okay. And I can bring that up in a second. Sure. Um, it, and it's amazing. So if you test negative, if you're RH negative, it means that you're part of a very small percentage of the world's population that has an older bloodline that still is, is separated and different. Now those percentages might shock people, especially when they start thinking, wow, why is everybody all asleep all around me and not understanding any of this stuff? And I seem like a, you know, some kind of a crazy person. Well, according to the most recent data, somewhere around 85% of the world's population is RH positive, whereas 15% or less is RH negative. Now, where did that come from? Well, during the time of Atlantis, one of these, one of these um, antediluvian civilizations we're going to talk about, they had a, po a percentage of their population that left before it was destroyed. And they went to places like the Basque region of Spain and Morocco and some other parts like in France. Northern and Africa, yeah. Yeah, and so today, that's where you find the highest percentages of RH negative. Okay, so it's, it's pretty startling to see those correlations. Now, that, so what that essentially means is we have two different genetic bloodline groups running around the planet. And one of them greatly outnumbers the other. And a, a lot of those people that find themselves researching this stuff and trying to go down this rabbit hole, the reason they get looked at so crazy is they become so far ahead hmm. of understanding the, the real information that makes up a reality that the other, the other individuals become so ignorant of that information that it just automatically gets rejected as being crazy. Yeah. And that's, that's how it works. So if you, if you're really frustrated, you're like you're walking around trying to explain Sumerian kingless to people. 
<laughs> there's a reason why they don't understand what you're talking about in most right. cases is because it's not taught in school. And there's no way that they could probably ever come across it to even look at it. It's it's the way that our system has been set up. Well, I mean, like it's just a, a, a re it's just more dumbing down going on. We have we see it in our modern day society. So between, like you said, us not having time to look into it and just it not being a priority just because of our you know, kind of social engineering. It's, you know, it's no wonder why we don't, people look at us crazy. That's why it's refreshing to have conversations like this. Cause of course you're not crazy. And it's just like the information is so deep and it's so vast and the implications of all this are just so huge. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, yeah. So, I mean, so this Eagle and the serpent, I give me get back to the symbology of what were that, what, what that means. These two factions of these beings became so greatly divided that they actually used to go to war with each other. A lot of Mesopotamian records that that talk about Sippar, these locations in the Fertile Crescent, which is you know today the area of Iraq and Syria, those areas used to have antediluvian civilizations that far predate ten thousand years ago. Okay, and that's the first point I really can make here is that we essentially have these two completely different time periods of human history that are separated by great disasters, and that's why. All of this technical sophistication became lost to us. Okay, now what you can see in correlation to all these around the world is that these, like I said, these these beings became fractured and greatly divided, and they took on certain symbols to represent themselves and those civilizations they were in charge of. And so they were given different regions of the earth, right? They were assigned different places because they were fighting so much. So you know, someone would get, you know, like Enki got a lot of Africa. And Enlil got a lot of, you know, a lot of the Mesopotamian area and, and, and so on. And so they, the symbols they took on, and I'll explain those, they, civilizations all throughout history carry them. And to this day, you can still, you can still see them. And that was Enki and um, Thoth and, and Ninma and whatever group was part of this benevolent side of wanting higher consciousness and humanity and knowledge, they were always represented by this serpent dragon combination they always show this plumed or feathered serpent and a lot of people try to take that in a linear way and try to picture some giant bird flying through the air or something it's nothing to do with that it's completely metaphorical it represents think about what the serpent represents if it was to transform a winged serpent becomes a dragon and that represents transformation that's why the caduceus medical symbol has interwoven yeah. serpents up in that then have wings at the top, okay? That represents our DNA and our ascension of energy. And that's what their group is. Which is just so fascinating because we see these images in our normal archetypal, you know, these images are demo- not demonic, but we've demonized these images of snakes and dragons. They're the bad guys. And not just, you know, and you're going to get into it, but like you said, we've been dominated by the, the image of the eagle. Look at look at you know America is an eagle, and yeah. uh, the, the the coat of arms in, in Mexico is an eagle with a snake in its mouth. And I'm sure you're going to yeah. get to that as well. But yeah, go ahead. And and so we see these symbols still today. You know, you walk outside and you see an ambulance go by you, and you're going to see that medical caduceus symbol right on there. It's all throughout medicine, and yet. Where we believe that serpents are evil, and yet one of the most important symbols of all that represents healing and medicine is a serpent. It doesn't make any sense until you understand yeah, yeah. that those that those symbols were inverted, right? To need to have their opposite meanings. And so let's let me so explain weird. something. So then Enlil and this whole side of wanting to control and 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 rule us through war and power, their symbol became the eagle and its variations, which include the phoenix. Okay, now. We've been manipulated into believing, or most people, that the eagle represents freedom and sovereignty, when in reality it actually doesn't. And I want to obviously point out the fact that I love eagles and it has nothing to do with eagles. It simply represents this. The eagle is the highest flying bird of all. It sees everything. It is a powerful symbol that represents both seeing everything and having power over everything. Okay, that's why if you look at during... um, the metamorphosis of the Roman Empire, the, when they were the Byzantine Empire, the, the reason they have the double-headed Byzantine eagle was that during that time period, they were having an expansion of the empire, and they wanted to show that that they could see everything, that nothing, that they could see both both ways, and that nothing would get by them. They were the basically the masters, and that's why we look at these symbols today, and it's, it starts to make sense 
when you incorporate this information. Whereas before, if you if you think that the serpent and the dragon is evil and the eagle is good, the whole thing is confusing because you see all these empires and these colonizers, right, like the Spanish, right up through through you know the Nazis and the Romans and all of these, where they carried this the, the eagle symbol and they were trying to become vast dominating empires and. It doesn't seem like a very good thing, does it? And that's 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 exactly the point. I mean, if you try to use logic in what makes sense, right. you'll be able to uncover a lot of this stuff. The conditioning is so deep, man. We talk about that a lot on the show. The conditioning is so deep. You actually, I mean, you really have to, uh, I don't know, break the programming in, in order to really see that because we're just so geared to, you know, we're inherently hate snakes or dragons. But, I mean, like I yeah. said, the archetypal type archetypal images of an eagle, like you said, flying high, freedom, land of the free, home of the brave. And, you know, it's it's just been inverted. Like you said, yes. the reality has just been inverted. It's crazy. And probably the best example of any flag on, on the entire planet, flat, the coat of arms and, and the Mexican flag, it shows, like you said, it shows an eagle that is grasping and holding a serpent in its talons. OK, now some people will come and come back and be like, to me and say, well, hey, hey, Matt, I was taught that um, the Aztec were led by an eagle to an island where they were then it would then became a symbol for them to, to create their civilization. Right. That's not true. That's not that's one of these um, influences of when the Spanish sent, you know, Cortez over and they and they colonized and destroyed the Aztec culture. That's where these stories were then infused in when when you had this infusion of um, Catholic, the Catholic religion into all of Mexico. That's how you had this confusion start. That's not where it came from. How how did um, how was Cortez? I mean, you have the backstory on that. The the Incan or the Aztecs were were awaiting a certain god that you know coincidentally wound up looking similar to Cortez when he came. How was speak to that and how uh, Cortez was allowed to be so effective because the Aztec kind of embraced him with open arms because they were expecting the return of this deity. After the antediluvian civilizations were destroyed um, d between the 10,000 and 12,000 year period, we had this restart of civilizations on the planet. The Aztec and Mayan were part of that restart of civilizations. And now during and during that time, one of the things you really find, especially with these um, post with these post civilizations versus the, the antediluvian civilizations, was that during this time period, you have heavy competition much, much heavier competition that existed before with controlling and corrupting these civilizations, okay? It became, it, it became a battle over, over who could control them and then corrupt them and have a, a certain story be then carried over throughout history, you know? Mm. Who are the heroes? Yeah. Who are the victors? Who are the good guys? Who are the bad guys? That's what this is all about. Now, this is one of the things I really extensively talk about in the stage of time coming up is that... If you look at the Aztec culture and the Mayan culture, you can see this corruption that occurred within them far before Cortez ever landed. OK, they were already corrupted by blood sacrificing war, and it had nothing to do with Quetzalcoatl or Kukulkan, which are these dragon serpent dragon symbols, the gods that they followed, which is just an, which is the most likely an incarnation of Thoth. And you can see that based on the connection that you have back to things like the Emerald Tablets and back to the teachings that he taught them, like the Mayan calendar and all of these aspects where... Well, those Emer Mayans... Emerald Tablets like you're about to mention, you just mentioned, those were found in Mexico, which I found so interesting. Teotihuacan in, um, I believe, in the like, somewhere hidden near the Pyramid of the Sun um, or the moon. And that's one of the things I, I get questions a lot about is how you can't really look up to find a real history of this. And I, I, I want to briefly touch on why that is, and I'll go back to what we were mentioning before and it's is the fact that there still are secret societies that exist all the, on the planet some of them are, are are bad like some of the secret societies that exist with the all-seeing eye connected to the illuminati and then there are ancient civil um secret societies that are still trying to protect the truth there's not that many of them left but there's still a couple and one of those secret societies they're um they're known as temple temple priests and they're essentially protecting the ancient pyramids and temples and what those represented from long ago, which was about harnessing energy and balance. And, and so when you look into the history of that, you find that 
it was discovered in Teotihuacan and then, it, and then it connects back to these influences of who was Quetzalcoatl and who was Kukulkan. Why are they the, shown exactly the same way and had the same teachings and try to help have these cultures find balance and knowledge of the stars? And what happened, right? Well, Kukulkan and Quetzalcoatl were the same being who eventually had to move on. Where do they move on to? I think they moved on to um, the region of Scotland, Ireland area, which is what eventually became the Druids and, and Stonehenge area. Okay. That's, and that's where the end of the line was for them too. That's why I talk about how St. Patrick's Day is one of the most evil holidays you could ever imagine celebrating because it is the representation of the last group of Druids pretty much that were wiped out. The last, the last serpent dragon teachings that were present in a large group that was then wiped out and eradicated. Now we have almost nothing left. Wow. So, but, but getting back, you have a situation where the serpent had, to, had set up and created these civilizations. And the proof behind that is with the Olmec and Toltec, okay? The Olmec have direct connections back to Africa, okay? If you look at the Olmec and how they have practices where uh, they harvest rubber, out of trees and you and you and you also look at the same in, over in Ghana and a lot of those areas near Mali which I mentioned about the Dogen you see strong connections to the fact that those the Olmec were were Africans that were then brought over and then were part of jump starting to create the Mayan and, and and then influence to be part of the Aztec okay a lot of these you know the whole Bering Sea Strait story is not true. Yeah. A, a lot of these things we've been told are are inaccurate because it would simply so significantly alter what we what we know of or what we think about ancient history that we would have to rewrite everything. So after <laughs> God forbid after, we can't do that. <laughs> I know. And so after Kukulkan Quetzalcoatl had left the Aztec and, and the Mayan, they became desperate. They became desperate. They went through periods of drought. They didn't know who to blame. They started to they started to become desperate, and you had this influence of this dark, dark influence from, in the Mayans, they called him God El, okay? And in the Aztec, he was known, they were referred to as the Jaguar and the Eagle, okay? That was the influence that we had. This was an influence of some of these more jealous beings, some of the other Anuna who had come in, I think specifically Nergal was one of them, who was one of the, one of the beings that was a god of the underworld. They pretended to be Quetzalcoatl Kukukan, right? To then invert and totally demonize his legacy, to then blame everything that then, that then occurred on him. Whereas if you look at, and, and go, go and go look at um, Chichen Itza, you can see um, these representations of a, of a, of a serpent being, Kukukan, and then all of a sudden next to him, there's this eagle that's you know piercing a human heart and eating it. And there's also references back to like controlling the pineal gland and everything. This this is the the story that they left behind. And of course, they don't fully understand. They're not going to tell these cultures. They're not going to be like, okay, hmm. listen, I'm I'm this person, and I'm I'm a malevolent being, and I'm gonna you know teach you blood sacrifice and war. Of course, they didn't do that. Right. These the Aztec had no idea that this wasn't Quetzalcoatl. They had no idea. It simply impersonated them and it influenced them to practice blood sacrifice and war and that's what corrupted these cultures okay that wasn't so, something they always practiced right blood sacrifices no, that was absolutely tell me not. how that how that began there was a, a leader of the aztec named moctezuma the second okay and during this these time periods these leaders they may have even been incarnated into, okay, like like Lord Bacall down in the Mayans may have actually been a positive inc incarnation that may have been influenced by thought too. But in terms of the negative side, Moctezuma II and some of these these um, these leaders, they became um, greatly corrupted, and I and I think that to me they were either incarnated into or directly influenced to do the things they did. And what they do, well, they started sacrificing sometimes you know, 50 to 100 people a day, just ripping their hearts out to try to, because that's what they were told would, br would bring rain and would bring back their, their wisdom and the, and the gods that they had. They were tricked into that. So by the time Cortez lands, you already have this fractured, these fractured empires that are, that are falling apart in some ways. So now get, getting back to what you said, 
so Cortez lands and he's this he's this Caucasian male with a, a beard, which I want to get back to the point where if you study um, the different traits of um, Aztecs and Mayans, they don't have facial hair. So automatically you have this you have this guy come over with a, a large beard and they confuse him with Quetzalcoatl. So let's think for a moment. So obviously Quetzalcoatl was not a dragon. That was a symbol and a metaphor for him. If they were confusing Cortez with being Quetzalcoatl, it means that Quetzalcoatl was actually, like they say, a like a, a long uh, bearded, long bearded older man. That represents the incarnation he took on to then come over and influence them. And and so when Cortez came over and he came over at a very specific time, if you go look at when he landed, it was right in that time period when Quetzalcoatl was supposed to be returning. It was, it was too perfect to be a, an accident. Okay? Right. It just shows you that um, whoever was in charge at the higher end of these of the Spanish conquistadors had this knowledge. Okay, and we can get into the fact that they had the eagle on their their early crests and banners, and how that's not any kind of a a random thing that that all right. happened. You see these empires and civilizations being puppeteered, yeah, being controlled so they can have a certain means and outcome. Right. So you have. And by the way, just think about the Americas themselves, the name America and the fact that if you look at the Incan god Amaru and how they called they called the the region Amaruca, you can start to see there right again when we're taught that it's about this Italian explorer near this um, that had a, a name somewhat similar. It actually had nothing to do with him either. So the Americas was this region of the land of the plumed serpent. That's what the name even means, because from South America all the way up through, um, all, all the way up through Mexico and into the United States, you had this worshiping of the serpent and dragon, and that's no accident. That's that's that just connects to the fact that they had the same influences all along. Think about it. How would that have? How would right. you have serpent representations all around the world if if they weren't connected or influenced at all? Very okay, fascinating. So, so getting back to this, um, Cortez lands in Mexico, and he. Um, the, the Aztec are confused about, about who he is and he plays along with it. And he essentially is able to, um, with only a handful, less than a hundred men, they, they end up killing thousands and thousands of Aztec. In fact, what they did was absolutely beyond brutal. If you, you look at the true story of what these men did, you'll see that they were far from heroes. The Aztec developed their, their, their central, you know, their main city on, on this ancient lake bed on an island. And so Cortez comes in and he he surrounds the city and he blocks every single um, land bridge that escapes this lake. And he traps the Aztec inside their city and he causes them to all starve to death. Over 100,000 were killed through starvation. And that's that's what he essentially did. Um, the, the Spanish were pretty known for their ruthlessness with their two yeah. inquisitions and you know things like that. Yeah, without a doubt. And so right after this occurred, you saw... Um, this uh, symbol of Mexico appear and it rep- representing this conquering of the serpent by the eagle, right? And it makes total sense if you look. So that's why we see this um, these representations of this eagle and the serpent struggle because in many ways it's, it, it represents two things. It's, it's, it is a metaphorical Represent- representation of the struggle between the side of us that seeks higher energy and knowledge versus the side of us that falls back on our demiurges in war. But on the other side, it represents this family struggle between how these civilizations will go. So fascinating. Well, and you said a lot of this, you know, it sounds like after Atlantis and, you know, some of the remnants of that knowledge spread throughout the world, be it, you know, Japan, China, throughout the United States as well. Talk to me about um, some of the some of the native cultures here down south, like the Hopi and the Pueblos, how some of they how they were influenced by, by all of this. Any civilization that has extensive knowledge of the flood, of the details of the flood and how they survived the flood means that they were alive before the flood, existing before 10,000 years ago. I want to make that point. Now, those include the pre-Inca, the early Mesopotamians, before we think of the Sumerians that left a lot of the stuff we talk about now. And ancient Egypt, which is called Kemet, not Egypt, that was a later name. Mm -hmm. Uh, The Slavic area where, where Bosnia is, where they're discovering some of these ancient pyramids with 
perfectly cut stepping stones that they that they they found to be just like all the other pyramids around the world that represent the pyramid of the sun the pyramid of the moon and we have of course the indus valley civilizations people always want me to talk about those which include the hindu culture and uh last but not least um the atlanteans and you could even throw on the lemurians if you wanted to go even further back but i want to make a strong point is that these cultures they go back more than 10,000 years ago. And in some cases, we don't even know how far back they go. Some of them may go back 50,000 years. Wow. Okay. We don't know how old some of these civilizations are. And I want to bring up an incredibly um, wonderful researcher that's done some great work on the Inca talking about this. His name is Brian Forrester. Oh, we, Brian had, we, had, uh, we had Brian on the show. Did you really? Oh, yeah. He's fantastic. So Brian Forrester talks about how if you look at – the Inca, specifically the Inca, you can see that in places like Machu Picchu, you have these megalithic structures down at the lower levels, and then you have a completely different style of building on top of them. Completely different, okay? And you see that all around these. Well, not these... even just style, wasn't it? Weren't these stones dated completely, like hundreds of years separately? The they ones... were dated differently, and they were carved totally differently. Yeah. That's what I'm about to get into right now. Sorry. So, and so when we when we look at these locations I, I mentioned, which when I mentioned Mesopotamian region, we're gonna you have to include Turkey right into Lebanon with all of these megalithic structures. Gobekli Tepe, key. exactly. Gobekli Tepe in Turkey. Anywhere in the world that you find large, and that's what megalithic means. Megalithic right. means a large single stone that was carved. Okay. Now the problem with that is that how do you move it? How do you move? these blocks that weigh tons go go look at Baalbek, Baalbek Lebanon okay or go and go look at go look in Egypt at the unfinished obelisk we're talking about about rocks stone blocks and that have been carved into something that are so big that even today in most cases we could not move so many people come in they say yes we could move them no we can't and, and that's what's even more amazing about it is that we're told that these civilizations back in the day were just developing and they moved all of these massive stones with just rollers on wooden blocks or whatever it was. It, none of it makes any sense when you, until you start to incorporate that all of these megalithic structures, that, like I mentioned, that these civilizations around the world, they are all part of a lost history, a completely lost time period that had sophisticated knowledge. Now this is where it gets, might help some people understand. After this deluge and, and the, these cataclysms that occurred, you look at geologic and ice core records. Okay, You look at ice core records from Greenland. You can see that the climate had these dramatic fluctuations that, we, that you almost can't see at all, even close in the last 20,000 years. We're talking about fluctuations that are so dramatic that they show that not only the climate of the planet became violent, but the earth changes as well, led to the disappearance of all of these civilizations that I want to strongly make a point again, yeah. that they were extremely sophisticated and they were wiped out. Well, that, that's consistent with, you know, obviously a lot of archaeological work. But Randall Carlson said that as well. You yes. could, you know, date this this cataclysm back to, I think, ten between about 10,500 to 12,000. But there was yes. that black mat of basically ash that they were able to ask. And it has those nano diamonds and yes, just all exactly. these different things that they know a certain cataclysm happened at, at a certain time. So. The nano diamonds represent an impact that occurred. And I think that the, that impact occurred first. I think that there was, um, based on what we see with the disturbance of how we're finding new evidence of Planet Nine disturbing comets and asteroids in the Kuiper Belt, okay? The Kuiper Belt's a recently new, recent new discovery. And it's- That Planet Nine, same times, as Planet X? Yes, and it's, it's more than 10 times as large as our, as our asteroid belt that exists between Mars and Jupiter, okay? And so, here you have this massive asteroid and comet field that, that exists around our outer solar system. And if you have something that perturbs those objects, they can send comets and asteroids flying into the central solar system. And that's exactly why we see these periods of um, these cycles of destruction on the planet that also coincide with um, sun changes, too. So it's these combination of these multiple factors that come together. Does it, our position in the galactic plane have anything to do with that as well? And that's another factor I, that you also have to incorporate is as our because our solar system is moving just like everything is moving, and as we're moving closer to the center of our galaxy, which we're nearing now, the energies change, and all of these factors come into play. Okay. Now, so what happened that if we look at you mentioned nano diamonds, 
you look at these impact craters up in Canada, you look at the ice core samples from Greenland, you can pinpoint that there was an event that occurred somewhere around 12,800 years ago or so. And then this is what's hard for other pe for people to sometime incorporate. Then there was another event that occurred. So there was a, a two pronged situation, two events. One was an impact of, of a fragmented comet that looks like it hit the ice caps. And the second was this massive tectonic earth changing event that, that, that allowed a lot of places like Atlantis and, the, and, and these other places to completely disappear. Okay. Now, Going back, what that means is these, these, these events were so destructive that, like I mentioned, these civilizations all around the world had these – they had these such sophisticated understanding of, of, of energy that they were harnessing massive amounts of it. Think about it. What kind of energy could you harness out of the Great Pyramid of Giza? It's almost beyond our, our, our ability to understand because we don't have anything – that can even generate that kind of that kind of um, energy, and that tells you that tells you right there that back then these civilizations and maybe even connecting to it's likely connecting right to the Anunnaki. They may have been even ones that were using the energy for themselves. We don't even know. But the point is, all these structures around the world were harnessing massive amounts of energy, and they contained incredible sophistication, and yet they were all wiped out, all of them. Now this is what happened. Like you mentioned before, read the Sumerian King List. It specifically mentions that after the flood, kingship was once again re-lowered again to, to the, the Fertile Crescent first, to places like Kish and locations like that, okay? And that's why you have this fracturing of human history that's been broken up into two different time periods. Now, hmm. so get so these these antediluvian civilizations, after these other civilizations were re jump started, like the Inca. OK, that the Sumerians, they tried to copy what was done before and they were unsuccessful. That's why you see such different building designs that continues to get worse and worse as these um, the generations go by and then the cultures start to lose this knowledge. Now, that's the important thing. Why would their building practices become worse? Why would in Machu Picchu would you see stones stone um stones that have been laid on top of each other that are so much less precise and so much smaller it's simply to me it makes so much sense that these that the the anuna specifically mentioned all across the world these beings they left most of them left or they stopped directly influencing these cultures that that knowledge and technical sophistication disappeared there was still knowledge that was given. The Sumerians had incredible mathematical knowledge, and um, they, they're the ones who understood the first of everything, right? The understanding farming and um, agricultural practices, the stars, reading the stars, the, all those, the calendar design, all of that came from the Sumerians. But they claim that they that they that it was given to them from above, from heaven, from these higher dimensional beings, okay? And so there was an attempt to restart some of this Tech, technology and sophistication, but then it stopped. That's why the Sumerians are the only ones, and the one those who branched on from them, they're some some of the only ones that still possess some of this information and knowledge. Most of it was was already lost. Well, right? and as time went on, I mean, I, they they kind of the keepers of the cheese, if you will, went into kind of the priesthood and the higher upper echelons of these kind of secret societies, if you will, and they kind of kept it, you know, they kept it hidden. I mean, they they kept that same kind of narrative and mantra going as as your inlil like i want to keep these guys stupid as opposed That's to right. keep them enlightened okay so let's now let's think about something for a second so after the antediluvian time periods and you get this you get this reemergence of, of sumer and you get this reemergence of what they're trying to build back up in our in this world it's very clear that if you look at the records that all of a sudden that stopped or became less and less every year and it, to me there was a decision made by enlil and others, where they, they they decided that after the flood, since it wiped everything out, that they would essentially start over and keep us all in amnesia of the truth. Because what were they, what was he doing at the time? He was trying to play the role of God in these in in the emergence of taking over religion. Now, were the which, Great Pyramids here at this point in your estimation and research? Oh yeah, the great the Great Pyramids are part of the the land of Kemet. They're part of the antediluvian civilizations. Okay. Anything. Any massive structure on the earth is part of these antediluvian civilizations. 
The ones that came after them tried to emulate them and they, they were largely unsuccessful in most cases. Um, but that's why we have this this divide between the two. So when you look at how they mm. they try to say that the, the, one of the pyramids of Giza is Khafre's pyramid and the other one's Khufu's pyramid, right. those Egyptian pharaohs had nothing to do with the pyramids. If anything, they're, they're the ones that probably helped to, just, to, just, to destroy some of the pyramids. If people don't know, the pyramids were made of different coverings. Um, one of them was black. One of them was white. The Great Pyramid of Giza had a, a white limestone covering that covered yeah. the entire thing. Go look at it right now. Go on the computer and type it in, and you'll see that the only limestone coverings that, that still remain are at the very top because they couldn't, they couldn't get to them. Well, yeah, that was a, that was a big thing of contention. I, I think I've mentioned somebody that you're not a huge fan of him. I'm really not. And I don't know if he's the, he's the head of antiquity or whatever anymore. Zahi Awas, like yes. just a guy who's been totally a part of the cover for so long. Huge. And, you know, God bless his soul. John Anthony West, Robert Schock, uh, yes. Graham Hancock, awesome. and all those guys went over there and did so much awesome work in the late 90s yeah. on, on dating the Sphinx. And, and literally, you know, showing, showing something so basic as water erosion. Exactly. As to as to why you could date the Sphinx just a way older older than when it was. Well, when was when was you know the Sphinx built? When was it facing the Leo constellation ten thousand five hundred yes. years ago? So it's I mean the information is really kind of there, but like your Zahi Awasis, man, geez, just so painful presiding over something so magnificent, like you said, that has the potential for so much, and he's just he's just a part of keeping keeping people in the dark, and I just can't and, stand that. And that's what is is part of what we need to understand and explain. So again, the other question I get so much is if this, if everything you're saying is true and all these civilizations are a lot older and there's all this evidence, then how does nobody know about any of it? And this is what's going to get into these archaeological wars we're talking about. That's a good segue for it. Yeah, it is. That's, that is what I wanted to segue into before we go. <laughs> how is the fact that nobody knows about this stuff? You have to go in to understand how controlled our world has become by certain powerful families like the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers and a lot of these families who have been able to monopolize and, t and, and take control of basically all of the, the governments and power of the world through through the um, the monetary system. Well, even but even before that, and this is still a part of the archaeological wars. You know, the sieges of Nineveh. When you start talking That's about, right. which, you know, the, the archaeological kind of looting that went on, because you know Nineveh, a place like you're talking about, the Fertile Crescent, that area is yes. so rich with this kind of antiquity. It's been going on for a long time, and that's why you know we're going to talk about it. Are these are these wars in Iraq? Are these wars in Syria? Are these a part of these things? So when did it begin, right? When did this war begin? I can trace it back to just somewhere just before the Roman Empire, somewhere during the time period of when you saw some of, uh, like for instance, when when uh, the Ashurbanipal Library fell to the siege of Nineveh. And, and that's a video that I actually have a documentary one I made talking about that on my channel because that's an area that I've heavily studied because it connects to this moment in time when there was a race to destroy. And that's hard for people to accept, but to, to destroy, hide, and suppress. I mean, this Whatever, is essentially the Library of Alexandria met the same fate. That's right. Yeah. Most people don't even have never even heard of the Library of Ashurbanipal, except for the fact that if you go look at where did the Atrahasis come from, where did some versions of the Enuma Elish, where did a lot of these, Epic of Gilgamesh, where did a lot of these versions besides Babylon come from? Well, they came from the Ashurbanipal Library, and then Babylon had some versions too. But essentially you had these, these key locations where records were being kept that then were sought for destruction. Now, like I was saying, um, who, what was the symbol of the Roman Empire? It was, it was the eagle. Yeah. At that point, we had we had this um, decision made to then create a massive empire on the planet that could that could go around and destroy not only the ancient evidence that existed, but be part of a legacy that would destroy any of the people connected to too. That's why you had this war against the Gnostics and pagans. Any any um, you know any religion that didn't follow this powerful monotheistic Abrahamic religions. They were wiped out and cleansed, right? And that's what the whole story has been all along. So they would, we look at something like um, the Nag Hammadi scriptures or Gobekli Tepe, situations where we found, um, or like the Dead Sea Scrolls in the Book of Enoch, okay? Though they were found in caves that were deliberately hidden and sealed. Mm-hmm. 
buried underground in some cases. Gobekli Tepe was was found buried under mountains of dirt. Yeah. The Nag Hammadi scriptures were found in a cave. Bar- it, we're talking about information that was being hunted down. And the only way to protect it was to hide it until the future when that system was no longer in place as much so that, that hmm. this information could get out. So all we have left are the scraps that haven't been destroyed. Yeah. Or so or they're kept like oh, oh man. that's that's really a good point. Yeah, the the one the, the, what is it the British Library that, that has archive. just all of those archives that just haven't even been translated yet. Where is all this information that still exists? It's in two places. It's being guarded by the Smithsonian in the United States, and it's being guarded by the Vatican in Europe. Mm. That's that's who's controlling the world's archaeology right now. Okay, <sighs> now how do they do that? You mentioned Zahi Huas. It's not that hard to do when you can control every aspect of who gets put yeah. into office and, and controlling the governments through controlling their money. You can make any decision you want. So what do you do? Well, you just put someone in charge who's going to follow the rules of, that have been established and this predetermined um, narrative that's been given. You just, you just you put them in place everywhere around the world, everywhere, like ahead of Smithsonian, and so that they all will, will, will play the game. I don't know if you saw the video. I think it was last summer. It was Graham Hancock, and somehow he got Zahi Awash there, and they were supposed yes. to debate about everything. Oh, yeah. He acted like he didn't know what Gobekli Tepe was, and he literally went petulant. He had a tantrum yep. like a child. I'm like, wow, dude, can't you just agree without him? He stormed out. He's like, it was just embarrassing. But it's yes. just it's it's just indicative of kind of what you're talking about. They he they know they're lying. And... They know, and more importantly, they're they're absolutely covering it up. Let me give you an example. We just had all of these discoveries of um, tunnels that have been found, you know, in in Egypt, under un, in near places like under the Great Pyramids of Giza yeah. and the Sphinx. Okay, if you actually, and I have this is another video I have on my channel too. Check it out about these secrets. But they they have found essentially tunnels that can a massive underground cavern tunnel system that may be far more extensive than even what we see above ground. Not in terms of large pyramids. But in terms of large underground areas that have been created. Now, if you go look, like here's a great one, for instance, go look at um, an aerial shot of above the Sphinx head, right? Above its head, you'll see clear as day um, an, an area that's been created to t- to go down into the, the the head of the Sphinx. And there's even pictures of Zahi Was himself, who is going down into this the, the Sphinx. They have tunnels underneath the, one of the paws in front of the Sphinx and on the head. So then what was the Sphinx, right? Is it a guardian? Maybe it's guarding these tunnels. And that's exactly what it was. The Sphinx is not a Pharaoh. The, 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 the image we see of the Sphinx was greatly degraded and altered. Well, yeah, you can totally Sphinx see the head is like a whole totally different head. Now. The Sphinx is supposed to be a lion. Just like you said, it's supposed to represent yeah. the age of Leo and it faces east. OK, it, it's protecting the entrance to these tunnels. Now, where do these tunnels go? Well, number one, they go deep underground and it's part of this harnessing of the energy aspect. And number two, they go to um, what may be the most fantastic library ever erected on Earth. And it's called the Halls of Amente. OK, or the Hall of Records. Yeah, yeah. You have a place that is supposed to be exist that exists that's been referenced by many in the past where it's supposed to have all the secrets of humanity's past okay now the reason i bring that up is we just had all kinds of discoveries about these tombs go look up the tomb of the bird the birds okay they just found tunnels under there that connect all the way to all these pyramids and then the sphinx and you realize that it's all part of an interconnected tunnel system but at the same time Zahi Kiwas and these organizations will give statements saying that the tunnels lead nowhere, they're of no significant importance, and yet <laughs> they're going down in like ladders leading down into these incredible tunnels and they're showing blackness disappearing and yet they don't show where they go. I mean, we're not stupid. No. It's just that people have their time is so consumed that these they don't they can't they can't bring, you know, take some time to sit down and look at all this and then if they were to try to think that this stuff is happening, they're, how are they going to be looked at? How are people going to view them? And that's what keeps all this stuff hidden. Well, and you, you know, know what the beautiful thing is from a larger perspective, man, I mean, going into this age of Aquarius, it's so beautiful because, you know, like I said, John Anthony West's work, Graham Hancock's work, all these guys' work. I mean, it's really starting to turn that that basic you know, 
elementary, rudimentary Egyptology narrative on its head, work like yours, even just conversations like this, people at least hopefully start asking more questions, which whole, slowly hopefully leads to that, as you talked about in your book, you know, you're an expansion of consciousness, kind of a, a reshifting of your paradigm of what is in your world. That's right. Um, and so when we look at places like, um, we look at places like just, out Cus just outside Cusco in Peru or Tiwanaku in Bolivia, something like the Gateway of the Sun. We can find these remnants of these antediluvian civilizations. And, and some people usually know that some of the famous um, locations like at Tiwanaku, the famous H's, right, which are like laser cut. And they're so sharp and precise that experts, which most people don't hear about, but experts have actually gone and considered and, and tested out the fact that could they create these using um, stone and bronze tools? And it was absolutely um, no every single time. So we're told that civilization arised 5,000 years ago in the mm -hmm. Fertile Crescent area and then slowly developed around the world as, as nomadic tribes. And yet we have this sophisticated building that completely contradicts everything that we're told. And that's why um, I'm trying to in the new books talk so extensively about these antediluvian civilizations because they represent the missing link to understanding how far back um, the timeline of, of humans go and then looking into well where did all this come from and how did human beings get this jump start with their genetics to become what we are now and so those are the two the you know those two big secrets they don't want people to know yeah. about well that was even written in the bible wasn't it something about the, the sons of God laying with the daughters of men. I mean, you, you can see in places in Genesis where they accidentally mention God's plural instead of God. I mean, come on. It's, it's so obvious that, that it's not really what we think of as this spiritual, all creating God. It's just these beings that are manipulating and trying to play that role. And that's, that's how it's always been. Well, before we wind up and wind up on this archaeological war stuff, because, but you know, when the Persian Gulf War started, I'm not sure if it was Iraqi freedom or back in the Operation Desert Storm, like one of the first places that was hit was the Library of Antiquity in, uh, in, or in Baghdad or wherever it was from, because yes. that's basically, you know, old Babylon. How much yeah. do you think what's going on now, the wars in Iraq, the war in, in Syria, you know, we've seen, I mean, whatever, I'm not sure how hip you are to this, but, you know, our government, is other, as yeah. well as other Western governments, are funding ISIS and the terrorists as a proxy war, yes. and they're going into places like uh, Nineveh and destroying uh, several different ancient sites. How much do you think that is a part of the, the, you know, Enlil, basically, the workings of Enlil? If we get past the idea that we're, we were really there to things like secure... Um, spread democracy the system of the planet and the, and the oil let's get past that for a minute yes those are reasons why we're there but i think the main reason why we had to go in there was that we were reaching this time period where discoveries was were about to be made okay and they had to put a stop to that so what would how would you prevent anyone from going in and studying a location well you would just create a war there it's very easy to do and then it would be so dangerous that Number one, nobody would be able to go to study that. Number two, those things could be destroyed and nobody would know or or have any connection to who did it. Was it just some, you know, local terrorist people or was it some kind of a, a connection back to some higher governments? People aren't going to know that because there's no information. It's so chaotic in, in Syria that it's a, it was the perfect cover. Yeah. Iraq and Syria, they are the locations where the, besides Egypt, the most important ancient relics existed. The most important um, inf information in history is in that area. So you can find pictures of U.S. troops guarding or walking through a lot of these sites. And you can also find information that shows um, that the Iraq uh, or the U.S. military was part of some kind of an operation right when Iraq was um, liberated where they um, ransacked the – the Iraqi Museum. Yeah, I, I, maybe which, I'd heard something about U.S. soldiers dressed as Iraqi soldiers, or something about that. Where, where anyway, that was that was one of the first places hit, whether it was Iraqi or Iraqis or the U.S. I imagine the U.S. going in to snatch all that all that loot. Yeah, we we whatever the affiliation was directly, or if it was direct soldiers, I've seen information on both. But it was basically an operation to go in and take all this stuff and steal it all and destroy it all. That That's why ISIS is shown in a lot of places 
um, destroying these 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 places these locations. Yeah, they're they're a hired group mercenaries um, from all over that area. Men, hired group of troubled men that have that are basically being doing the dirty work for them. Okay, yeah. that's it's like similar to you. Think about it. Did the CIA did the CIA directly kill Kennedy? No, they hired the mob so that so that their so that their hands wouldn't wouldn't have blood on them. Plausible deniability, man, at all times. Exactly. That's why the, all these terrorist groups are used for this means. It's to essentially wipe all this stuff out. Okay, to wipe it out so that um, they this lie, this perpetual lie and doctrine that we're being given can continue. I mean, bro, it's 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 beyond a even lie. I mean, this goes it, it goes back to the cosmic war to this very moment. The inversion of reality is just right. absolutely. It's just. It's insane. It's just so cra- it's crazy to me, and I'm really hoping that that is true. That we're moving into another celestial epoch or whatever with Aquarius, where this is more coming out, and we're moving away from, you know, the, the wars and just. I mean, we're seeing now whether it's real or not. You know, the 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 Jewish synagogue, insane. The guy sending bombs all over the country, insane. Well, you know, our political leaders, you know, kind of okaying physical violence. Basically, I mean, it's it. We're in crazy freaking times, man. So basically, you have this rise of Zionism, these, which is part of the Rothschild family, where they want to have, you know, this superior race, kind of similar to what the Nazis wanted, but they were part of, a, you know, that Aryan race. What what is all what is going on with all these bloodlines fighting? What are they doing? They're trying to have this master superior bloodline control the world, and they want to essentially. Um, depopulate a lot of the rest of the population it's sinister sinister and really sick and it's one of the areas that a lot of people will avoid because of the energy that's associated with it but the truth is when you look at the fact that wars have been funded and fueled directly from both sides and on on almost every single occasion and created as a means to have some kind of an outcome one of those outcomes unfortunately is is a, a lot of people end up losing their lives. I, and and I think it. I think you're right. I, and I, my, in my just own personal opinion, I, I think there is going to be a large culling of the population. And if you've seen the movie Judge Dredd, uh, the mega cities, everyone's in mega cities. Everyone has a phone. Everybody's tagged. Everyone's you know being watched, surveilled. You can't almost mark of the beast out. You can't move anywhere without a chip or some kind of digital you know X Y Z. That think that's part of the rise of cryptocurrency, etc. And you know. And then the outside is going to be kind of the savage land, the, you know, your preppers, your people living off the land, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, that's kind of a doomsday scenario. But I just I see it going. I, I really don't know. I don't I, I, we talked. I talked the other day about, you know, Civil War, too. It seems like they're prepping for something like that. Um, I mean, obviously, they do use wars well, to get rid of people. But what do you what do you see is coming up here, man, in the next the few years? The whole idea by them is they want to divide. That's what Democrat, Republican. That's what all these things are. They're just divisions. Yeah. They're a means of having people not come together. Okay, and it's, so at the same token, you see all this hatred for so many people around the world and groups that it's just like empty and really ridiculous if you think about it. And th- that's all just this deep-seated hatred that's been created to divide us. Now, <clears throat> maybe this is a nice place to transition to so we can have a nice happy note, which I usually always talk about this as, as an ending anyway. But <laughs> we, these different zodiacal time periods are – how the energy of that time period is determined. So Pisces, um, the last two zodiacal time periods have featured a negative polarity. And Pisces, in many ways, from the research I've done, that was more of a trick that was that was done um, because I think Marduk was involved and he was technically on Enki's side. So this, there's a lot of confusion in how these beings determine who is going to rule a certain age and what that energy is going to be. But basically it comes down to this. Th- these beings have to follow and adhere to balance. Okay, they they know that the, the time period of Aquarius, no matter what, is a positive polarity. Okay, so that means that the reason all this is going down right now, this is this is basically the end of a dying empire, and that that's the empire of what we see around the world with this, um, you know, try to create wars and try to acquire all the natural resources and and care little about the natural environment that's that's this what we're we're leading up to this and this transcends right left ladies and gentlemen by the way this just gigantic um conclusion to everything they've been trying to lead us to and the reason so much is happening in the last couple of years is that they're trying to accelerate it because a are just like um the mayans said 
and we're reaching the galactic center and we're reaching this universal consciousness. So our energy is automatically going up no matter what, despite all the, the ways they're trying to dumb us down physically. So that means that they have to do an increasing number of things to keep us in this lower state of energy. And that the reason they're doing that, they're trying to establish who these heroes are of our reality and who the, the enemies are and what the truth is versus what what's not true. So that when we do go into Aquarius, it can all be completely backwards. They're trying to set the stage mm. for the future to not have the the information needed so that they can accelerate to to the you know to the to the next stage of, of their evolution of their conscious evolution energetic evolution which is you know a time of aquarius when the veil is lifted and humanity reaches the next stage in its in its path and that's what this this battle and, and war is over it's what will humanity's future will be and what will what will the majority of the population end up end up following and and so you and I and those out there who are even just on a minor level trying to help a few people, that goes a lot further than we might, we might realize. It doesn't take much to tip the scales. And right now, we're at the point where this system is starting to crack, and that's why so much is happening to try to you know, bring it, to, to tighten it back up and, and go back to the old way, but you can't. I yeah. mean, the rabbit's out of the hat. There's no way to put it back. We are, we are, um, we are quickly realizing the truth and so so then the, the do you think part, there needs to be a a you know a the other way a storm before the calm but there's going to be some very challenging couple of years coming up but when you once we get through that i think there's going to be this dramatic reversal be, because as an age is transitioning you get chaos hmm. it's this again the dying empire aspect these 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 beings of the eagle they don't want to let go of power here. They don't want to let go of what's been designed here perfectly around all of this. And it really is. It's a wicked, 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 perfect design. Yeah. When you see how they've the media they're controlling, controlling the narrative of how we think through religions, through these think tanks, the universities, it is very wicked and very entrenched. It is. And so then, then the most common thing I have people ask me about this in regards to this is, if the truth is getting out so fast, then why are so many people still asleep? The answer to that is for someone to actually wake up. You know, it's not about them coming across an ancient aliens episode or finding some little tidbit here. Because what's going to happen, right? Someone gets interested for, for two hours in, on a weekend, right? They're, oh, my God, that's amazing. I'm going to look at it, look at it, look at it. Are they going to continue? Or are they going to just put it aside and go back to their other reality? Because it's too difficult to try to incorporate all of that. Right. Here we are where we're these beings that have a very short amount of time here on the planet. And we have free will, which means we can decide to do whatever we want. But the, the constructs that have been created around around us often prevents us from following a certain path because of how it's been designed. And I, I strongly encourage people to have that, you know, follow the, the path, regardless of how difficult it is, is, as much as they can. Because in the end, when we think about what we're leaving, by, leaving behind here and what we're, what we're going to be doing for the future of our entire species, we... This is the moment in time that's never existed before when technology and an interconnected community has access to any piece of information that we've ever had. Right. And so now is the time when we have to make this great stand and not pretend that someone's going to come save us. And because this is the moment when I think you see the whole term millennials and all of these different terms that are used for the certain group that a lot of people think are like ruining the world and, and such. But you see this group that's fundamentally different than the old ways. They, they, they don't want to work 60 hour weeks. They want to pursue different aspects of their happiness. This represents this fracturing mm. of what is, has been protected and generation after generation taught. That's no longer the case right now. We're seeing this time when we're having this, this great leap and this great change. And, and, but instead of just, focusing on games and the fun of all the technology that we're being given, we should use it as a means to becoming to become as lightened as possible for people. They want to break this illusion here. They want to break all this that's going on to try to get away from the distractions. Get out in nature. Connect to what, you know, the energy of 
of our planet and regain yourself. Yeah. Lose, lose the wireless signals. Lose all these things that attack us, even though we don't realize that they attack our, yeah. our energy and our vibrational frequency. We have to get back and, and have this cleanse of both our, our physical body from a lot of things that are bad inside us, as well as this cleanse mentally. And, and just reset ourselves and then decide whatever path we want to take that makes that feels the most right inside. Right. Get back to trusting ourselves through intuition and trusting and trusting that um, as we acquire knowledge, we become our own independent objective observer of of everything and we can make whatever decisions we want to. Without a doubt. I, I even had a post the other day and it was just weird because I forget what one of these events happened this week, one of the tragedies. And I just go online and people are, you know, it's this person's fault, it's this person's fault. And I just said something to the effect of, you know, d after you see something like this, you really want to go on Facebook and argue with somebody you disagree with or disagrees with you. Why don't you go kiss your husband, kiss your wife, kiss your daughter, kiss your dog, kiss your neighbor. You know, love as hard as you fight. Because the choice really, I mean, they can't be the changes that need to happen can't be legislated. It comes from within us, and we have exactly. to, we have to make those choices, man. This has been absolutely awesome, and you can come back through when uh, you drop the new book. Because I'm sure you're just going to have equally as much fascinating stuff to talk about. Wow, this is this has been a pleasure, my friend. I really appreciate it. And let us know where we can find your stuff. Um, and I'll just give it. I'll give a quick update. Um, the stage of time I feel like is going to be. Um, and the, the illusion of us was my previous book, and I, it's a very important book. But I feel like the stage of time is what I've, everything has led up to essentially. It's going to be some, something that I is is what I want to leave behind of everything that I've figured out or acquired, or with the help of so many other gifted, amazing people that have influenced my life. Right. And I'm I'm planning on um the hope is to I'm very confident I can release um early 2019. So I'm almost at the end right now, and I'm, I'm really excited to release that one. And, but I also like like this discussion, I have my own YouTube channel at Matthew LaCroix. Please check that out, I have a lot of content on there. A lot um, of content, ladies and gentlemen. Your boy has been spending hours since he gave <laughs> the green light to this interview. So yes, it's a wealth Thanks. of information. And please visit my new website I just launched at thestageoftime.com. It's, it's gonna be my author page. And I also have a Facebook page of The Illusion of Us. But I wanted to get it, I wanted, you know, cause Facebook, we have to be careful to have a medium that's not going to be taken down or have so much control. Exactly. So I wanted to get a website established so I could prevent anything like that happening in the future. Sure. So Jeff, thank you so much for having me on. It was a wonderful discussion. Absolutely, man. This is, this has really been very stimulating. I hope everybody had their notebook out and taking notes and please, as he's even said, don't necessarily just believe what he says, go reference this. A lot of this stuff is exactly. in museums, in libraries, you know, it's out there for the, for the absorption. This has been Matt LaCroix, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you again so much, sir. Peace. So much love, ladies and gentlemen. Stay tuned. There will always be more.